G'day folks, thanks for tuning in. Today's video is dedicated to answering the most frequently asked questions I get around using a troubleshooting oil paints for miniature painting. The channel recently passed a thousand subs, and to celebrate I wanted to give something back. I'm absolutely blown away by the support, so thank you all very much. And if you're new here, welcome, I hope you find this helpful. We've got a lot to cover today, so I'll have the timestamps for each topic linked below. From what primers to use, to how the colour of the primer can impact your paint job, whether to varnish or not to varnish, the difference between cadmium and non-cadmium paints, as well as the difference between colours across brands and grades. We're also going to spend some time troubleshooting our pre-glaze, and we're going to look at paint application, adhesion, and how to avoid muddying up our mixes. So let's get started. I probably get the most questions about primer, and which to use. If you're coming from acrylic, then you'll be familiar with a lot of these products, and they all work just as well for oils. From your hardware store rattle cans, to your specialty hobby primers, the GW's hilariously overpriced alternative, we've got a bunch of options. Brush on, spray on, airbrush on, it doesn't matter. Some cowboys even use gesso to prime, and that's also totally fine to do. Lately I've been using this coast grey from Vallejo. It's a nice neutral grey, so it doesn't interfere much with the colours that I'm putting down. It's also light enough that I can clearly see my pre-glaze when I apply it, and, more importantly, that you can see what I'm filming. But other colours and values have their advantages. One of the challenges some folks have when starting out with oils is managing their visible brush strokes, and a bright primer like this grey or white might not make sense if you're going for a dark colour scheme. I recently painted the Space Marine over that same grey primer for a colour theory video, and while I think he's pretty good, you can see a few spots where the primer shows through. And while we use pinline washers to fill in our recesses, we do need to pay extra attention when working over a light primer, and doing a few touch-ups after the paint is dried can sometimes be necessary. Alternatively, I recently painted this motorcycle from Marvel Crisis Protocol over a black primer, and my overall finish is a lot smoother. The dark primer doesn't mean we can't use brighter colours either, as the metallics and headlight didn't take any more effort than they would have if I'd used the grey. So when it comes to the colour or value of a primer, whether it be white, black, or something in between, I recommend picking something that complements your colour scheme, as that'll make your painting life easier, and ultimately more enjoyable. Another popular priming technique is the directional prime, where you prime black and then progressively build up to white from the direction of your light source. This is often called zenithal priming, as it's common for the light source to be coming from above, but that's not a hard and fast rule. You could do this with a brush, can or airbrush, and the benefit is that the highlights and shadows are roughly sketched out for you. And with oils we can achieve a similar effect by being intentional with the direction from which we wipe away our pre-glaze. But give both a try and decide what works better for you. Lastly, there's nothing stopping us from combining all of this and using different primers for different elements on the Mini. I did this with an airbrush, but it's just as easily done with a brush, as the goal is to sketch, not finalise. Now you could of course spend a lot of time on this step, but instead use thin glazes to apply your colours, but that's a specific technique, and I wanted to keep the scope here general. So let's see it in action. I've got a pair of bases here in black and grey primer, and out on the palette I have Van Dyke Brown and Radiant Blue, which is my quick go-to combination for concrete. You can see with the lighter primer how easy it is to get a sense of that Van Dyke brown. And you can also see how thin it is. Now this is too thin for my liking, but I can just go back for more paint and pile it up. Conversely, with the black primer, it's much harder to see what's happening, so I need to pay more attention to how it is on my palette instead. Even after I wipe away the excess, it won't be until I lay a brighter colour down on that black while I really know what I'm in for. Now this isn't necessarily a bad thing, just something you need to expect and to plan for. Some radium blue on the first base, and you can definitely see the brush strokes, but that's to be expected. The blue and the brown cancel each other out and give us a nice grey. On the second base, the contrast is a lot higher due to the dark recesses, but I reckon the brush strokes even at this stage are a bit more forgiving. That being said, it takes only a few seconds on each with a clean round brush to scumble all those marks together. Now you can start to really see how the primer influences the paint. In addition to that contrast, the second is much cooler and less saturated than the first. This Van Dyke brown is pretty neutral to begin with, but in this context it looks positively warm over the grey primer. Now all that said, none of these things are good or bad, and at the end of the day the primer is just there to give you a starting point, so just pick one and give it a go. At the other end of the process, I get a lot of questions about varnishing to protect our work. Similar to primers, we have a lot of choices, from hardware store brands to specially formulated, brush on or spray, but the bigger distinction between varnishes is the type of finish that they'll give us. These finishes will usually either be gloss, matte, or satin, with the latter being somewhere between the two former. When painting with oils, many colours are naturally quite glossy, even after they've dried, particularly reds like the one I used on this Red Guardian. 
to counter this, you might want to apply a matte varnish for a more subdued finish. However, doing so could really change the look of your model, particularly if you're using an ultra matte varnish. They tend to have a desaturating effect and can also dull your highlights and shadows. Now this isn't necessarily a bad thing, just something to keep in mind. If you wanted something in between, then a satin varnish may be the way to go instead. Varnishing too soon can also impact the integrity of your paint, and it can cause it to shrink or pull away, particularly in the recesses. Most minis will be dry to the touch within a few days, though some colours like yellows and reds will take longer to dry. Because of all this, I like to wait at least a week before varnishing, ideally two, just to be safe. Matte varnishes also have a tendency to kill any metallic effects, as the diffuse finish dulls the sparkling effect that the flakes in those paints give off. I have a video on this where I revisit this marine to restore what was lost in the varnishing process, and you can find that linked here. That may sound like I'm against varnishing, but I'm really not. Coming from acrylics, where colours tend to dry more matte, it's been a process finding what works for me. As oils tend to be a lot more durable, an argument can also be made against varnishing altogether. But I find having more control over the finish has value, and more protection is never a bad thing. My advice is that if you're happy with the finish, then leave it. If it's too glossy, give it a couple of weeks and try a satin varnish, and then follow up with a matte if it's still too shiny for you. And if you're painting any areas with metallic paints, perhaps paint those after you've varnished the rest of the model, or varnish your model with a brush so you can selectively target those other areas. While the names of oil paints tend to be a lot more standardised than they are in hobby acrylics, you won't find any Orc Elbow Green for example, there still can be differences between brands. Take these Van Dyke brands from Gamblin and Windsor and Newton. You can tell by the swatch alone that they're different, despite having the same name. Thankfully, oils usually come with pigment information, and if we look on the back, we can see that the Windsor & Newton contains PR101, a red pigment, in addition to the black and brown that they both share. So let's see what this looks like in action. I have the Gamblin on the right, and the Windsor & Newton on the left. The Gamblin seems quite thick out of the tube, and it's pretty dark. The Windsor & Newton, on the other hand, is thinner, slicker, and much brighter and more saturated. Admittedly, we could have inferred these last facts from the tubes themselves, but it's always useful to see things for yourself. What we couldn't tell, however, is how well they stain, so let's try that now. Unsurprisingly, the darker colour is the stronger stainer, but the other one still holds its own. Both could make for a good foundational colour, though the value, saturation, and overall potency of the Gamblin to me would make it much more versatile. As well as the differences between brands, oils can also differ between grades. I have here a student grade Viridian Hue, along with an artist grade Thalo Green, both from Windsor and Newton. Now while they do have different names, the swatches are suspiciously similar, and if we look at the pigment information, they're both pigment green number 7. So what's different about them? Usually the higher grade means a better quality of pigment and binders, as well as the amount of pigment used. That being said, the student grade is cheaper, so if it performs close to the artist grade, then we could stand to save ourselves some money. Starting with the Viridian Hue, it goes on pretty thin, it's quite transparent, but it's still a nice looking green. Now for the Thaler. Very similar in hue, but thicker and darker due to the better coverage. And as expected, it's a better staining colour, but that doesn't mean the student grade is unusable. Far from it, and you could make it work with just a bit more effort. Next I want to talk about cadmiums and paints in general that have metal additives, as there's usually a big difference in both price and quality between these and their substitutes. I have a student grade cadmium yellow pale hue, and two artist grade yellows, one with cadmium and one without. Now these aren't all the same pigment or brand, but I wanted to demonstrate what a difference both the metals and the grade can do to a colour, over a black primer, because yellow over black won't keep any secrets from us. So no pre-glaze or thinner here, we're just going straight in with the student grade faux cadmium. Now for yellow over black this is still pretty good. Yellows tend to shift towards green over black, so this is expected and it gives us an idea of how transparent the paint is, even though it's still covering fairly well. Now for the real deal. New brush, no thinner, but I'm still wiping off the excess as we're not going for impasto here. Look at that. Amazing coverage, barely any green shift at all, just good, robust yellow. But comparing a real cadmium to a student grade substitute isn't fair, so let's try the Radiant Lemon. I wish I had something closer in hue to compare with, but it's still a yellow of a similar grade, and we can still compare its coverage and its opacity. Both are looking pretty good, I'd say somewhere in between. They're closer to the cadmium than the student grade, but another thing we can test is how well they mix. I picked indigo as it's a fairly robust paint and one of my go-to foundational colours. We can use stronger paints like this to shore up issues with others. Even though the faux cadmium doesn't do too well on its own, it still makes for a nice green when mixed in with the indigo, and you can see that the coverage is pretty good too. Now the true cadmium, being a lot more powerful, requires far less to get a green. 
and you can see how well said green just pops a little bit more than the other, and is a lot more opaque. Lastly, the Radiant Lemon is going to give us a very different green, but the coverage and opacity is again closer to that of the cadmium than that of the student grade. So if you're hesitant about using cadmiums, then an artist grade or higher alternative would make for a great middle ground. And if you're struggling with some of the student grade faux cadmiums, it might be worth upgrading. Another painting question I often get is what do I do with my pre-glazes and staining? Again, I'm going to use this Windsor & Newton Indigo to demonstrate. Generally, darker colours are stronger stainers, but not all paints are going to stain, and some will do so better than others, so I wanted to show you some techniques to get the most out of them. First I'm going to apply it straight from the tube, with no thinner added. The lack of thinner makes it a bit harder to push around and get into the recesses, but we can still get good coverage with a bit of effort. Now even if I wipe it away immediately with my makeup sponge, we still get a decent stain, which would be even stronger if we let it sit for 5-10 to 10 minutes. So keeping your paint thick is one way to maximise your staining potential. Conversely, if I added a brush load of thinner, you can see that even though it gets in there more easily, it's much more transparent, and if I wipe it away, there isn't much left behind at all. Now let's meet it halfway, layering on thicker paint, keeping in mind that there's still thinner on that pauldron. We're left with a stain that's somewhere in between. So with your pre-glaze, you want to find a balance between paint thickness and ease of application. I mentioned that leaving your pre-glaze on for a time can also increase its staining potential. I'm going to put some heavily thinned indigo on the helmet, and let it sit for 10 minutes. Even this diluted, a bit of time can leave us with something to work with. So if you've used too much thinner and don't want to wipe it away or add thicker paint, try letting it sit for 10 to 20 minutes and see how you go. At the end of the day though, I'd argue that the amount of stain isn't necessarily as important as the simple presence of a pre-glaze, to give your subsequent layers something to interact with and be influenced by. If I take some undiluted white paint and apply it to each section, you can see that the pre-glaze is still having an effect, and the biggest difference is in how easily it's adhering and blending, due to the relationship between the amount of thinner in the paint on my brush and that on the model. Which brings me to the last topic for today, paint adhesion. Arguably, two of the biggest challenges with adopting oils, especially when coming from acrylic, is paint adherence and avoiding mud. Mud refers to a desaturated or muddy look that usually comes from overworking your paint. And while it's not inherently a bad thing, it can take a bit of getting used to. Both of these things are related, so I'll show them together. First I'm going to apply some indigo straight from the tube, as before, but I'm not wiping it away. Then I'll grab a touch of cadmium yellow, also unthinned. Now even when I first apply it, it's already mixed into a greenish tint, and if I work it even just a little, it gets even more green and less saturated, even with all that cadmium. This is fine if it's what I wanted, but what if I wanted yellow? If I take just a touch of thinner, and apply it in one stroke, Look at that. And even if I come in and feather that edge out, my blend is far more yellow than the first try. This is because thinner paint sticks to thicker, and vice versa. This rule allows us to paint in layers, even wet into wet, and with practice you can complete an entire full mini of complex hues and values without waiting for parts to dry. And to show you that it works in both directions, I'm going to put some thinned indigo onto the underside here, then take some undiluted cadmium yellow, and as before, with one stroke, we can preserve a good chunk of that colour. Now you could get an even better result by using separate brushes, but I wanted to show you that it's possible even without, as paint consistency is the key factor here. It's not an exact science, but you can count on it as a rule. And again, if I thin down this yellow and apply it to the thinned indigo, it adheres a bit, but with far less intensity. Now as for mud, the biggest cause is overworking the paint. Often in the pursuit of a perfect blend, we can go overboard, as each brush stroke further mixes the paint and any thinner present. Now this is an extreme example, but it can start off gradually before snowballing like this, and so it just takes practice and trust in the process to avoid. It can happen on the palette just as easily on the mini, as picking up this yellow on my indigo stained brush only becomes more of a problem the more I work it in, so let's try it with a clean brush. So now we have fresh paint over thin paint, and I can come in with a clean, dry, round brush to blend with, but I'm only blending the outermost edge to get that nice gradient. If I wanted it more green, then I could blend in the rest but I like to build up to this, as it's always harder to go forward than back. Now if I want to add more yellow, that same paint suddenly isn't sticking. This is because the blended section is thicker due to what we just applied. So with barely a touch of thinner, we'll try again. There. But again, the more we work it, the muddier things will get. This process can be useful when exploring and adjusting, but it can be real easy to get caught on that blending treadmill, especially with the final highlights. My advice is to take it slow, 
just a few taps on the edge of your gradient, and then reassess. At the end of the day, knowing how to get off the treadmill is just as important as knowing when. It's easy to overthink what you should do, instead of just embracing what you can do. The biggest strength of oils is in their flexibility, and by familiarising yourself with their behaviour, you can adapt to just about any situation. So that about does it for this video. I hope you found these topics useful, and that these tips will help you along in your oil painting journey. This FAQ is by no means exhaustive, of course, and I'm looking forward to doing more videos like it in the future. Thank you very much for spending time with me here today, and again, a massive thank you in helping me reach this milestone of a thousand subscribers. If you want to further support me, I have a Patreon link down below, which you can get early access to YouTube content like this, as well as extended real-time footage of most of my videos, and more. So thanks again for your company, and take care.